He who once revealed himself to all men is now hiding himself from them in judgment. You get there and you show up and there's the throne. It really is real. The preacher wasn't that crazy. Okay, I am ready to believe. No. No, it's over. The revelation is withdrawn. To whom much is given, much is required. As you measure it, Jesus said, the revelation that's given to you, as you measure it, as you seek it out, more will be given. Now it's judgment that's gone. The one who's there now, you don't know him, and you won't, except in judgment. Another thing, in chapter 4, there's a rainbow. Now, I know that symbol's been hijacked in the cruelest form, but that rainbow is a sign. God's covenant, of God's promise. It is a sign of God's salvation for sinful men. Not a banner by which men can continue in their perverted sin. It is a symbol of His faithfulness to those who believe. It is a symbol of hope. I will not destroy the earth again that way. It is a symbol of so many redemptive things. And it's found there in, Ro in, in Revelation 4. But when you get to Revelation 20, the rainbow is gone. Why? There's no longer any promise or hope of salvation extended to anyone. It's over. I know that it's so hard to get our minds around. Why? Because even in academic setting, I find it amazing a student has been just totally just negligent totally all semester hasn't done his work hasn't attempted anything he's going to flunk the class and he comes up and he says yeah but profi you know help me here you know give me some extra work to do and because our educational system is so putrid the professor's not yeah here here's some extra work we got to get you passed that's not going to happen. There's no extra work. There's nothing else you can do. It's over. It's gone. Yeah, but no. And that's why when you set rules in your own home and you do not act upon them, all you're doing is preparing children for Judgment Day. That's all. Don't do that. And they continue doing it. Don't do it. They continue, don't, and they continue, and they continue. All they've learned is <laughs> authority. There's always a way around it. I can do, I can keep going. I know when to cut it off. There's going to be a day when you can't, it doesn't matter. It's over. It's over. Also, in chapter 4, there were all these thrones that were placed around the throne. Elders, whoever they are, we have thrones. But now those thrones are gone. Everything has been withdrawn. It's like even these mighty elders, whoever they are, they've taken up their thrones and they've walked off the stage in fear. There's no one there. It's almost as though God's saying, now it's between you and me. No one else here. Now, be negligent. Now, rail against me. Now, defy my word. Do you see that? Here's another thing that I want you to see. On that day, you stand there alone, without lawyer, without advocate. No one, as the old Puritans would say, no one shall show thee pity. No one. Not father, not mother, not brother, not child. No one will advance your cause. As a matter of fact, 
When you take your first step into hell, the last thing you will hear is all of creation worshiping God because he has rid the earth of you. You say, how can that be? How can it be? Let me share with you something. The Bible teaches that all men are radically depraved. In the same way that Hitler was radically depraved, that he was not some phenom. He was literally us. Now, the reason you're not that is by God's grace, he restrains your evil. We hear all the time of, of even children that will murder their own parents, plot and murder their own parents. Do you think that child is just exceptionally wicked? And that your children aren't like that, or you weren't like that when you were a child. There is a thing called the restraining grace of God that restrains the evil of men so that history can continue, so that God's redemptive work can go on, and He can be glorified in it and men can be saved. But on the day of judgment, you must understand that all the common grace of God that kept you from being the most vile monster on this planet will be withdrawn and you will stand there as you are now with no grace restraining your evil, nothing making you lovely, nothing making you lovable. You are you. All the time you've been pretending to have virtue and merit and prancing around thinking you can earn your own salvation. If someone said you were bad, you would get mad at them not knowing that every virtue, every restraint from evil has only been because God's grace made you able to do that. But now he's pulled back and there's nothing left there but a monster. Do you see now, here's something that you need to understand. Many of you have never even heard any of this. And you think, well, who does he think he is saying these things I've never heard? Herein lies the problem. If I were to simply say, well, I'm saying this because it's scripture, you could say, I hope it's on the tip of your tongue. Well, that's your interpretation. And obviously you're wrong if the great majority of people today are saying just the opposite. But here's where validation of church history comes in. If you look back throughout all the church history at those men and women who truly embraced the scriptures and suffered and died for their faith, these were the very things they all said. Even all the men that so many people, well, Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest, the greatest preacher who ever lived, he, he believed this. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the Puritans, the Reformers, the early Baptists, the early Methodists, the early Presbyterians, the early Congregationalists. This was common food in the pulpit every Sunday. And now it's like, where, from where do you come with this strange teaching? When you look at Israel, and they're worshiping in the temple, supposedly, walk out of the temple, and then go worship Baal, and deny everything the scripture says and you go, how can they live in such contradiction? Then look at contemporary Christianity. And be very, very careful how you judge Israel. And when you look at Israel, how could these prophets rise up just affirming the people in all their sin and pretending like God was just some old grandpa that would delight to see them no matter how dirty they are? Where does that come from? Same thing you see today, don't you? So what I'm telling you is not some invention of my own. And it doesn't come, I wish, I wish it did, from the brilliance of my own interpretation. Although I do interpret the scripture that way, I want you to know that most of this I learned from 2,000 years of church history also. And the way men of God and women of God have always approached the text. I think we probably need to stop there. We didn't get through verse 1 there are some things that we saw. If it were in me, if it if you were able to endure it, I'd preach the next five hours because this text is so important. But know this, especially, um, listen to me, if you want to walk out of here saying, well, that was weird. If you want to walk out of here saying, well, Gosh, it felt like I was back in the 1950s or something. 
Or who does that guy think I am? Think he is? Let me talk to you for some, just a second about something. It's called patronizing and intellectual integrity. Now, if you want to go toe to toe academically, we can. But I want to talk about patronizing and intellectual integrity. If you're here today and you say, <laughs> I'm an atheist, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I'm an agnostic, this is absolutely insane. I disagree with you, but you've held your course in logic. You do not believe that this Bible is anything other than fiction. And you're at least walking to some degree according to what you claim to be your conviction. And that is respectable intellectually, even though I believe you're wrong. You're consistent. But what I am coming to grips with more and more as I travel around this country, around the world, is this. I'm a Christian. Who you say I'm not a Christian? I'm a Christian. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Well then, what do you believe? And then you say, well, I believe this, this, this. And then I'll do like I did one time in a big riot that broke out on the West Virginia campus. Uh, this hate preacher was there preaching and these people were screaming at him and this girl kept making the same statement over and over about Lilith and uh, all that type of Gnostic doctrine and things like that. So I screamed out to get everybody's attention. Show me your primary documents. Everybody just stop, turn around. What? You made a statement about Lilith. Show me your primary documents. From where are you drawing this? You making it up? Because if you're making it up, then you're standing on the same grounds I am. Just, you see, here's the problem. I could sit here and I could argue for the, the validity. I could seek to vindicate the scriptures. I could do it in a theological manner, a presuppositional manner. I could even do some evidence to debunk maybe some of your ideas. But here's the issue. If you sit there and say, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe any of that, then here are your possibilities. If you are a Christian, then you indeed love even the worst of sinners. That would be me, because I'm twisting the scriptures and misinterpreting them. So you need to come to me and explain to me why this is a wrong interpretation, if you are a Christian. If you say, well, it's not so much your interpretation is, I just don't believe that part. Now here's the question. It's a big question. As a matter of fact, it is a question that changes the entire world, at least your word, world view. So now, the Bible is not your authority. Who's the authority? You are. Now here's the question. From where did you learn Christianity? The Bible. But if you set yourself up over the Bible, then there's a problem. You, you prove invalid everything else. See, you can't pick and choose. The same Jesus who said, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, that is a part of Scripture. And if you say, Well, this other part of Scripture I don't believe, then you've set yourself up of Scripture, you've become the authority of your, for your faith, and your opinion's no better than anyone else's. So do everybody a favor and stop calling yourself a Christian. Because it's a matter of authority. Now, another thing, because I've been around a long time, you walk out and go, that's just his idea. Okay, if it is my idea and it's wrong, perverse, and twisted, then you owe it to me to come up and interpret this text. To take me by the hand and say, sir, you're sincere. You seem to have studied, but you're so wrong. I say, show me, please. But don't walk out of here with some smug intellectualism that you're somehow don't embrace any of this because your intellect and your culture is so refined. Because actually, you're being absurd. Throw your Christianity away and then I will allow you to do that. But I'm not going to allow you to say, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, but all that stuff he said today was just wrong. See, you can't do that. Because if you still remain positive toward me, you're only patronizing me. And in yourself, you're contradicting. I'm not trying to be brash. 
I just kind of know the way people think, not because I read their minds, but because when I preach on something like this, this is what usually comes. <sighs> Don't listen to that. You see? Be very careful. But if God has used this to stir up something in your heart, then I would tell you, run to Christ. Run to Christ, not to this church, not to a preacher. Run to Christ. Because He suffered the divine, the vindictive justice in your place and paid it all. And we are saved by faith. It is a thing of grace. No man can boast except he who boasts, boasts in this, in the Lord.